Hello, I'm John Fox. I'm here in the Collins Archives in Glasgow, surrounded by almost 200 years of publishing history. Now, 200 years ago, words such as tweet, icon and follow had very different meanings to those in common usage today. So, who monitors these language changes? And who decides when these words go into the dictionary and when the meanings change? Elaine Higgleton heads up the team here at Collins. So, Elaine, how did it all begin? Well, it all began back in the early 1800s with William Collins, who was a Scottish philanthropist. There was a big tradition in Scotland in the 19th century of reasonably well-off middle-class families really wanting to put their money into education and into things that would help raise the level and standards of the working classes and the middle classes. So there was a very big movement towards publishing books for education and books for self-improvement and, and, and to help people better themselves and to help provide education for all. And William Collins was really part of that whole ethos, that whole thing that was going on in Scotland at the, in the early 19th century. So what came next? So one of his first dictionaries was um, an, a family dictionary, which he called the Household Dictionary, which was aimed very much at middle-class families and households. And then he published illustrated dictionaries in the 1840s. Some of them went on to sell millions of copies. Everyone remembers having their own gem dictionaries at school. I know I've got many. They are the, the classic souvenir, if you like, from, from that part of your life. When did all this publishing start for the gems? Well, the first Gem Dictionary was published in 1902 at the price of a shilling, and it's really become the best-selling little dictionary in the world by far. Can you tell us a bit about the bigger English dictionaries now? Yes, I think the uh, real innovation with English dictionaries for Collins um, came in 1979 when they published the first edition of Collins English Dictionary. It also included entries for people and places, and it was the first everyday dictionary to do that. And of course, it also really focused on current vocabulary, so the words that people needed to know and use on an everyday basis. So what were the buzzwords at the time? So the buzzwords at the time were things like nuclear winter, iron curtain and cold war, which creates a really nice parallel with some of the buzzwords this time, which of course includes Arab Spring. That's gone into the new edition of the dictionary. And also this time we've got things like gleeks and Boris bikes reflecting our concern with the environment. So how have techniques changed for dictionary makers? We now, of course, have a lot of computerised um, uh, data sets and particularly the Collins Corpus. And the Collins Corpus was developed in the 1980s and we were the first dictionary publisher to have a big corpus. And what a corpus is, is millions and millions of words of written and spoken English that have come in from all kinds of sources, newspapers, magazines, books, media, television, radio, lots of transcribed speech and articles and writing and presentations. And it just sits in a big database and we can, we can interrogate that to see how language is really used today. So we can see, for example, how corpus shows us how meanings change in the use of cloud. Because of course, only a couple of years ago, clouds were only those white fuzzy things that you see outside of the window and that bring rain and snow if you're, if you're unlucky. Now, of course, we all talk about cloud computing. So again, the corpus shows us how language is changing and really helps us find the new uses of, of, of words to make sure that our dictionaries fully reflect the language that we're all speaking every day. With the increasing rate of the evolution of language, it's now more important than ever to have an up-to-date dictionary. And it's great to know that Collins can provide you with dictionaries, however you want them, wherever you are.